and exercise science from Manitowoc. Um, also teaches a course here for us. Yeah. And um, has a PhD from is it Augusta State? Uh, MED, Ma Master's of Education. Yeah, Augusta State. Yeah. Okay, yeah. in yeah. Georgia. Yes. Right. Yeah. And he's going to be talking about sweat. Yeah. So, <laughs> without further ado. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, again, thank you uh, for inviting me, and uh, you have a beautiful campus. Um, you're very fortunate to have master gardeners and bookworm gardens and um, just all the artwork and stuff, so um, it's not on all the campuses, so don't take that for, um, for, uh, for granted. Um, like I said, we'll be talking about the fountain of youth, and... Um, it's kind of geared a little towards an, an older population, but uh, I think all, everything can apply to uh, everybody as well. So um, this is our outline for this evening. I'm going to be talking a little bit about the historical pursuit of this idea of the fountain of youth um, and how it's always been kind of this elusive goal that people really haven't achieved. Um, and then kind of how that transitions into, we still have this kind of idea of this fountain of youth, but it looks a little different now than it did 2,000 years ago. So um, then we'll kind of transition to looking at kind of how our idea of, of exercise and fitness is, is changing. It's a relatively new field in the scheme of things. And then uh, go into some detail of how sweat is maybe our fountain of youth. So uh, if you have any questions along the way, feel free to, to, to raise your hand or, or whatnot. So, um, so here we go. Uh, let's start to talk about some of these things here. So this idea of the fountain of youth, um, it's always been kind of external. Right? You have to drink something or bathe in it, and somehow it will restore our, our youth, our vigor, um, and kind of tied in with our youthfulness and vigor, there's kind of a, this kind of sexual vitality that uh, will will return, and uh, it will increase life expectancy. So here's a, I'll try to infuse a little bit of um, the liberal arts. We look at a little bit of history, maybe some art and literature. I kind of try to tie that into um, my lectures and what I do as well. Um, but here, this is all little sculpture, um, they kind of read it from the bottom um, and then up. So you kind of see the transition. All right, there's a bucket load of folks going to this fountain. Right? They've been carried there in carts and on piggyback. Somehow they bathe. And then if you look up here, they're a little frisky, right? Their youthful vigor and sexual energy comes back to them, right? Um, So this, I was kind of, you know, I was thinking like, well, where did this idea of this fountain of youth come from? Um, and we can kind of trace it back, back to the Greeks, right? The Greeks are kind of the, you trace everything back to the Greeks pretty much. Um, and they are uh, polytheistic, right? They had a, a whole host of different gods and kind of the, the top god was Zeus, right? That's where the Olympics came to, it was in his honor. And Zeus was married to uh, Hera, and they had a daughter, and her name was Hebe. All right, and Hebe, she her job was to um, kind of help the, the or to kind of give the pantheon, the whole, all the gods, kind of water to restore their eternal life. Um, so she had this fountain. You'd always carry this fountain and this little saucer. So whenever you see um, a goddess with a little fountain, a pitcher, and a cup, she's offering that to the, the other gods so they can continue to live forever. Uh, she's also seen with a phoenix. Right? What's the idea of a phoenix? Right, the rebirth, kind of rise again. Right. So it's, she's always kind of pictured with with this fountain and a phoenix. And uh, often, like the Greeks, 
they accentuate the human body or kind of part of the humanist, right? They took these nebulous kind of gods and they gave them physical bodies and they kind of accentuated the, the beauty of the body. So a lot of times he's making sculptures of men and women, but they're mostly depicted gods. So looking at a little bit of literature, kind of again with the Greeks, at Alexander the Great, right? He, they had the Exa uh, Alexandrian Library in Egypt, uh, or Alexandria. Um, and there's a story in there about this, this, this fountain, this pond, where the people could go and they could restore their, their youth and their vigor. So there's another illustration of that in, the, in one of Alexander Romance. And uh, moving ahead, kind of I put this chronologically versus by content. It's so kind of moving ahead um, in the biblical times that the lame, the sick, the ill uh, would often lay by a pool. And if, if they saw that pool ripple, they usually had someone that kind of throw them in the water. And when they, they thought the first person in that water would restore their, their their ability to walk, their ability to see, their ability to get rid of leprosy and different things like el different ailments. Um, so there's in the Bible they depict the pool of Bethesda, right? And um, so I, I put this picture in here too, uh, kind of going back to the religion. Uh, that's uh, from the Bible, right? That Jesus offered eternal life through baptism and, and whatnot um, and other things. But um, I put this picture in here because when we were in the Louvre, we traveled to Europe about in 2014, and I literally stood about this close to, the, to this painting. And I chose this one because um, I didn't really know Andrea or Andrea del Riccio. I know I can't pronounce his last name, but um, his understudy was Leonardo da Vinci. And this is one, this is maybe his first painting and he's uh, understudied. So if you look at the faces, this is kind of gaudy, but these are kind of more round. And um, so Leonardo da Vinci painted the little cherubs and that's one of his first paintings. So that's why I chose to put that in. Uh, also shows up in the Quran that um, um, El Kadur was one of the prophets, and uh, that he makes a trip to this water of immortality and finds this fountain of youth as well. Um, that was, that gives kind of a eternal life by bathing in this water. Uh, again, a lot of, uh, I guess, Renaissance is kind of when they started not painting about religious paintings. Uh, and they started to broaden their perspectives and paint other things, other literature and whatnot. So this came out of the, the Renaissance as well. And we see, again, people on horseback, getting carried, got no white, gray hair. Uh, they're coming in. They're getting help to get into the pool here. And then, all right, getting a little frisky again right here in the, the getting their youth back. And then they, 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 they go out, right? So that's Again, this the idea of this fountain of youth is depicted as one of the topics in the, in the Renaissance. Um, again, kind of going on there is the exploration um, and the Spaniard Juan Ponce de Leon. We probably know him for putting his flag in Florida, but one of the reasons why he came was to seek new fortunes for Spain and one of those things he was hoping to find was a fountain of youth in Florida, well, in the in the New World. So again, coming out of this time, um, Marie Antoinette, right? French. All these are different French paintings of aristocrats. All right, and if you just look at kind of aristocrats that um, the many of them thought they had kind of a kind of a, a God-given right to, to rule, right? That there, there was kind of this lineage um, that they were 
follow. So if you look at a lot of these women, Maria Antoinette's in the middle, ruler of you know, French, England. Um, these are other probably contemporaries of her before that came before or after her. But if, if you notice, they're all she's got a fountain here with the picture. And you can see the Phoenix here. Phoenix in the picture. The Phoenix over here. So all of them have a phoenix and a picture. So all these women um, are depicted as Hebe, right? This going back to this Greek goddess of with eternal vigor, right? So this is one way that they could live on and be remembered beyond, like after they die, right? They didn't have photographs, um, but this is one way they could basically live beyond their years by having these these paintings and to be de depicted as Hebe, the Greek goddess that gave eternal life. And uh, again, the, the French gave us the United States gifts, right, Statue of Liberty. So we had this kind of strong connection with France. And uh, this was a, an early American painter. Um, but he painted Liberty as Hebe as well. You can see the, the picture, and maybe instead of a phoenix, we have the American eagle. So again, kind of this young America at the time <coughs> may have kind of this eternal, youthful vigor as a, as a country, too. Uh, bring it a little closer to home, bring it closer to the modern era. Um, if, if you travel on hi Highway 43 between Manitowoc and Green Bay, Denmark, if you take uh, off-road, you'll see uh, maybe Maribel. I don't know if you ever pay attention to that, but there was, back in the 1800s, it was a, um, a destination resort for a lot of people from Chicago and, and whatnot. And they have, uh, now they have caves there. I encourage you to check those out. But um, they have a lot of spring water there. And people from uh, Chicago and stuff would come up and they would bathe in this water and drink this water and it was was supposed to cure ailments and give you kind of youthful vigor. That maybe not necessarily the fountain of youth, but that was kind of the idea behind it. So even in our neck of the woods, there was this this idea of this bathing in this this water and drinking this water, and it will restore my health and youth. So there was a windstorm a few years ago, and it blew a good portion of it down, unfortunately, but. Um, 2013, maybe, when we had a big hailstorm. But. <clears throat> so in literature, again, kind of moving closer to the modern era, Mark Twain wrote this. I, um, if I had been helping the Almighty when he created man, I would have had him begin at the other end. Start human beings with old age. Much better to start old and have all the bitterness and blindness of age in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... And even today, people go to the Dead Sea, right? They slather this mud on them. They bathe in this salt water, and it's, it's supposed to cure their ailments and restore their health and youth and vigor. Um, I like to joke these two were uh, 80 when they went in the water, but. Uh, <laughs> so we may not have the same idea, but I think that idea that I can drink this and I can put this on or bathe in this and we can kind of restore some of that time that was that's that's lost. Yeah. It's interesting that you're talking about all this. I'm thinking about Franklin Roosevelt. Okay. And because Georgia, you know, where you got sure. yeah. and Warm Springs down there is where he went after he contracted polio. Okay. Because he thought that there was some myth that this water would help Sure. He'll live, and then he might be able to get his legs back and be able to walk again. Okay. So he spent several years down in this huh. um, spa. Okay. Very good. I was unaware of that, but I might have to look, look into that more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so in culture today, right, we've got uh, kind of going off Mark Twain's quote, Benjamin Button, right, if you, I don't Seen it, uh, he starts at old age and all right. Uh, kind of dating 
our, myself here too a little bit with uh, big, right? He was he wishes he was a boy wishing he was big. And, um, other ones were like the parent swaps lives with the child and stuff like that. So again, that kind of idea of like you know, the opportunity to go back as a youth, right? How how great would that be? Well, the point of the story was that it wasn't that great, right? But um, even in our popular uh, media, right? Every other magazine you pick up, um, you stop aging. Um, seven years younger. Want to look younger? Read this magazine. Um, um, what was this one? Fight aging. Okay, just gobs and gobs of magazines when we consume this stuff, right? Because we want the next tip. What's the next scientific breakthrough? What's you know, how can I eat this and drink that and bathe in this to sh shave off years? Uh, so again, books. Probably once a year, different books get published. They catch the eye of a talk show host and they go on a circuit and talk. Um, creams we can rub on our face to make us look up to 10 years younger. Right? Now all I have to do is buy this little cream and rub it on my face. Okay, here's another stuff. I was like this one. Ridge filling base coat. Is it like a ridge, like a point? You know, like, so, uh, and it's men are not immune to this too, right? You just kind of change the colors, change the name and call it architect serum instead of a anti, you know, anti-aging cream and um, we got a whole new market. All right. Um, again, talk shows, they talk about all this stuff. More books. Uh, they, uh, yeah, they can get this for, uh, <laughs> maybe get this at the health store if you're kind of more of the organic type. Um, or, you know, or you can buy this, excuse me, junk, you know, or whatever, and uh, um, appeal to our youthful side. Um, if chips and Doritos aren't your, or, and soda is not your gig and alcohol is, maybe uh, alcohol is our fountain of youth, right? That can uh, get us what we desire, right? <laughs> um, so over-the-counter products. Also, uh, maybe we see specialists, right? That can promise taking off years. All right, again. Um, Kind of go back to this idea, right? So, our idea of the fountain of youth looks different than it did 2,000 years ago, but the concept is still there, right? I drink this, put this on me, and I'm going to take years off my life. So, it's kind of a historical perspective, and I was kind of thinking, like, um, what if our fountain of youth isn't something we bathe in or drink, but what if it comes out of us? Right? Our sweat, our sweat could be our, is our fountain of youth because um, we look at all the you know, different studies. I'll try to summarize some of them here in the next part of the lecture here. But um, as far as what comes out of us actually helps restore a lot of this, th this stuff. So, you know, I'm not a really historian, but I think I find that stuff fascinating and kind of how that perpetuates and still how that's kind of ingrained in our culture today. Um, is there any other kind of questions about the history before we transition to the next part? Okay. Yes. One of my favorite quotes is Mother Teresa. Okay. She said, do all you can, whenever you can, or whoever you can, for as long as you ever can. Yeah. All right. So. And I, I made a... All right. Excellent. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Excellent. All right. That's good advice. <laughs> so, all right. <laughs> this idea of this fountain of youth, right? It's it's their choices. We have to make these choices, and uh, many things seem more appealing at the time, right? But uh, uh, they are choices whether we acknowledge that or not. 
So again, kind of thinking of this idea, okay, where um, this idea of, of fitness, again, it's, it, wasn't, it hasn't really been a, a profession really since maybe the 50s or 60s when we, um, before the 50s, John F. Kennedy put into place the uh, President Council of, of, of Fitness um, because we weren't really on par with the communists um, and we wanted to <laughs> show them who's boss, right? But uh, um, this idea of, of fitness really didn't come into vogue until like the, the 20s-ish, okay? So, and there was a group of women called the Flappers, all right? So if you look at the Flappers' mother or her grandmother, um, they came out of the Victorian era. Um, in the Victorian era, like they had these big hoop skirts, right? They were literally enforced with wooden hoops. Um, and they had corsets uh, that were made from whale bones, right? That shaped their figure. They had all these external, and the big bows and ribbons on their uh, bottom, right? Just kind of accentuate these the female curves and whatnot. And uh, the flappers in the 1920s kind of revolted against that mindset. And uh, they threw away the corsets, right? They, sh they showed off legs and skin um, instead of these big, big dresses. They had kind of these pencil thin, short hair um, idea of, of fashion. And so instead of relying on external sources to control one's figure, women began to turn to dieting um, and kind of exercise and smoking to, to shape their figure. So about a decade later in the 30s, that, that's kind of when the medical profession, the medical field started to see aging as a medical problem to solve. Um, before that, it was kind of seen as a natural part of life, and that then in the 30s, um, something um, changed that idea that this is now a medical issue that we want to avoid. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Uh, part of that, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sure, yeah, there's more medical uh, understanding of the body and, and whatnot. So, yeah, it's, we want to preserve life, right? So and life. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this idea of fitness was more vanity. It was really geared more towards women. Um, and it wasn't really a thing men really had to take seriously. Um, they were out in fields and factories and whatnot. And this was kind of more, again, marketed towards women to shape their figure, to keep them ladylike um, and whatnot. And it's very kind of passive, actually. This, this is just a little belt that you kind of lean into and it would jiggle for you, right? And you just kind of, you just kind of lean back and it would jiggle. <laughs> yeah. um, I remember at my, in my, my step-grandma's house at the it was like this thing you sat on and had these wooden rollers. And I was like, what is this for? And it was, and it was I don't know when she acquired it, but it was supposed to kind of roll away cellulite in the butt and thighs. So you're just kind of sit on this thing and this machine would zzzz, you just kind of sit there and like, oh, it just kind of rolled away the cellulite off my butt and thighs, right? So uh, again, this, they were more seen for vanity, you know, shaping our figure, and we didn't really understand. It was kind of passive. Yes. <laughs> yeah. She wants that nice posture that, you know, lady. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, they're all, yeah, very ladylike, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and for women to sweat in public, that was kind of, that was a, that was, that was a no-no, right? 
Um, they didn't think the female was the female body was capable of certain vigorous physical activity in, in this era. So again, our understanding we thought the heart had uh, so many beats in it that if you expended those heartbeats, you would die sooner. So vigorous activity was really not uh, thought on highly. Right? They thought Roger Bannister first recorded human to uh, run a sub four minute mile. And they really thought that if anyone was able to do that, they would, their heart would explode and they would die crossing the line, if not before. Um, but he finished. Everyone was kind of holding their breath. Like, he's still alive, right? <laughs> but, uh, and we thought like fitness, we thought, again, more for vanity, for show. This is Venice Beach, California, where people still lift weights on the beach and show off their muscle bodies. And it's, again, kind of more for a spectacle and show, um, more than any type of uh, use, daily uh, use or benefit. So again, um, our idea of exercise and fitness is continually changing. And a lot of the studies, you know, when I was going through college and stuff, the, the, the idea of aging was that after age, certain age, every decade, you're going to lose about 10% of your, your heart function, your lung function, your muscle function, your joint function. You know, every decade, it's going to go down by 10%. Okay, but if you look at the people we studied, all right, that if we look at people who are young in the in the 50s, exercise wasn't really that promoted, um, and women were meant to be ladylike and sit with legs crossed and just kind of be more sedentary um, or just kind of do light. Work. We don't want to sweat in public, and your body's not geared for activity, so don't do it. That was kind of the idea of men. And as they age, right, they weren't physically active, so age, the aging caught up to them much different than we understand it now. So they're the same people. No, I just, I'm sorry. Yeah, I just kind of. I just one. Yeah, no, I, I grabbed pictures from the internet. I just saw. Uh, yeah, Heidi. Can I share a story? I see there's some younger girls here. So I heard the story a million times, so I'm going to tell it to y'all. So <laughs> my mom always was like, when I was in high school for basketball for Fia, they wouldn't let the women, the girls in high school, cross center court. So for basketball, they had one special person called the Rover. So she was being physically fit to be able to play full court. But all the rest of the girls, Did anyone else have the rover in basketball? My department chair. I, I was a wrestler. <laughs> <laughs> My previous department chair, that was her experience growing up through, even through college. Um, so this is a new story for a lot of people. <laughs> well, I, I didn't think yeah. girls by yeah. <laughs> yeah. But they didn't feel that the girls could really handle full court basketball. Huh. And that's not that long ago. No, no I would say not. <laughs> so this idea of aging, we after a certain age, we just people would just forget about it, right? You're not going to function the way you were before. But uh, now, with kind of like especially with baby boomers, um, that that we we've, we've got a new outlook on what physical activity does as we age. Right? That it's, it's preserving one's quality of life. Much, uh, much longer in life. So here's just some examples. You know, I've looked at you know centurions or different uh, different people out there. So maybe you've seen um, this woman doing yoga. Um, this guy's you know, they still have track and field events in certain areas for all age groups. Great relays in particular in Iowa. Um, 
97 years old, this guy's 92, right? We think our current understanding would be like, well, they're gonna shatter bones, they're gonna break hips, you know, this is, they shouldn't be doing this. But um, when we're active, right, we preserve a lot of our body functions. So, uh, another example, 91 year old finished a marathon in seven hours. My first marathon, I did it in four hours. You know, so, I mean, 80-year-old uh, summit Mount Everest, and just behind him is an 81-year-old. <laughs> right? So he holds his, the oldest man to summit just for a few days. So I'm not saying you have to run a marathon or climb, climb Mount Everest, but the point is it's still possible. Right, that these people are are able to do these things. Um, so, kind of find you know what. Not that you have to go to this extreme, but doing something is better than than nothing, and it will you can grow out of that. So, I was just kind of looking at some stats here. Uh, people who smoke, especially smoking past age thirty, um, if most average. Smoker starts around age 13. We found if a smoker makes it to age 65, they got about a 30% chance, one in three chance to making another decade. Uh, heavy drinkers, when they make it to age 65, they have about a two thirds chance to make it another decade. So people who are physically active, 91% uh, of them live another decade. Um, I, I would say the quality of life before death is probably much better for people physically active than people who smoke or drink. So um, again, if I were to give you, if you were to give me one dollar, invest one dollar in me, and I would give you seven dollars in return, how many of you would take me up on that? Okay, <laughs> pretty much every one of us, right? So what we find is if we invest one hour in Exercise, what they're finding is about the return on investment is about seven hours of added life expectancy. So um, there was a study from Iowa State University that um, investigated a group of people and uh, found that they live on average about three and a half to four years longer than people their age who didn't exercise. And uh, so we, in the fitness world, we look at the, the fit principle. Maybe we'll have to answer sure. the question. Sure. Okay. So we look at frequency, how many days a week. So they're saying as little as two days a week that people experience some benefit. And uh, if it's not very intense, we can do that six days a week. The I stands for intensity. And one way we can measure it, intensity is how much oxygen we use and how much we exhale. So that's called a metabolic equivalent. So right now you're probably using one metabolic equivalent. It's, it's basically how much air you use at rest. So a five to eight metabolic equivalents or five to eight mets is about you know, five times the amount of oxygen you're consuming now. And that's that's a mod that's a upper moderate level. So you're breathing heavy but you're still just I have a conversation. How do you measure that? Um, if I say, let's say I'm supposed to hop on a treadmill. Sure. Uh, how would I know how many minutes I was at? There's, there's a formula, which I probably won't go into here, but um, most people, like in the cardiac rehab, they'll, they'll use this a lot. Um, <laughs> for the lay person, it's just kind of a, a best guess. Um, but in science, there's an equation you can put in, like how much, and then uh, if you want to do it real specific, they hook you up to how much air you're consuming, how much oxygen you're exhaling, and then looking at the difference, and looking at your blood oxygen saturation and all that. So it's, it's pretty complicated, I mean not complicated, but it's more expensive than the lay person.
Yeah, so just if I were to get up and walk down the hall, I'd probably go from one net to about three nets. So just kind of an easy walk is about three nets. Um, if I were to start like jogging, um, that might be five or six nets. Probably under eight nets, I can still have a good conversation. Once I get above like 10 nets, then I might have to pause between each breath. And then once you get up to over 12 nets, then you're moving pretty hard and you know, you're going to be, you're going to be gassed when you're all done, right? What does net stand for? Uh, metabolic equivalent. And that's mostly with oxygen and how your cells use oxygen and stuff like that. Take 220 minus your age, and that will give you your maximal heart rate. Um, and then you can take 50% like of that, and that would be kind of a lower target heart rate zone. And if you go up to like 75 or 80% of your maximal heart rate, that would be your upper level. That would be gasping for air when you're exercising. So that would five eight minutes. That's probably. 50 to 60 percent of your maximal heart rate. So, good, good connection, right? <laughs> yep. All right, so again, this is another um, chart from um, the study that followed three quarters of a million people over uh, a decade. Maybe 2,000 died during that time. So they found that people who expended, this is a net per week, per week. So with the fewer nets or the fewer energy they expended, the more risk for death they had. Now here, the more uh, nets, more energy, basically the more oxygen they consume, uh, the more years they gain. Okay. So if you can get up to um, 30 hours a week, that's um, four years to your life. Those are going to be quality years typically too. Um, so there's this, again, within the fitness industry, we're looking at more of exercise in a dose, right? That um, if you can do something, something's better than nothing. And if, if you can get it in 10-minute sections throughout the day, that's better than nothing. If you can do it in 30 minutes, that's even better. Um, but if you can't do 30 minutes continually, you know, 10-minute chunks seem to be better. Uh, so 30 minutes of moderate intensity activity is kind of recommended, but if you can go 60 minutes at a more moderate intensity, that's where we start to get more of that investment back. Um, just kind of hopefully next time, hopefully in the future when you go to the doctor, um, they'll say, here's a month uh, membership to your local gym or even the one attached to our hospital. Uh, we, you know, we need you in there three days a week. Here, here's a work excuse. You can get out work an hour early to do that or something like that. So um, again, our attitude plays into this a lot. So again, just kind of looking at some study or da uh, some data. Yeah, only about six percent of people age 65 or older are getting the recommended amount of cardio and strength training um, each each week. I think that's six percent, right? That's um, and healthcare is a really big issue in our nation right now. And Social Security and all that stuff. So I talk to our students like these are issues that we're dealing with now, but will be a continual part of your adult life that we're going to have to deal with. And ultimately, it's going to come down to all of our decisions 
what we do with our time. So I wish I could say I coined this term, a sweat fountain of youth, but I, I Googled that term and I found I didn't find any books on it yet, so maybe that's a professional development uh, <laughs> plan, but um, there are some graphics out there. So again, that's kind of, uh, again, the history of this idea of fountain of youth. Um, our current, or the transition of how we understand this idea of fitness a little bit more. So, again, I propose that we're not going to bathe something, we're not going to drink something that's going to preserve our life. Our, our diet plays a big role in this, but it's, uh, it's not a cure-all, end-all. So, instead of something bathing us, this, this liquid, this fountain of youth has to come out of us. And, um, there's been all, uh, just growing more uh, amounts of research on this, and I'm just trying to just kind of scratch the surface on some of this here. But. So, we kind of often overlook our hormones, but our hormones control pretty much all our uh, physiology, how our body works, it how, how it communicates. Um, so whatever I had, we had the customer appreciation. I had a $1 Jimmy John for dinner tonight, right? So, <laughs> um, it's getting, well, it's probably still in my stomach now because it was just a couple hours ago. But um, all those nutrients that were in that start to enter my blood. And my brain decides or my hormones and stuff, my body's telling me what do I do with all those nutrients. Um, and if I've stressed myself, I did exercise earlier today, so um, my muscles are maybe broke down a little bit. So there's, they're sending out hormone, there are signals to say, hey, I need more quadricep muscle cells to be re regenerated. So. The hormones, especially human growth hormone, will send a signal to the neuron, uh, the the uh, um, my DNA in my cell, and it's going to unzip a section and it'll get the recruit the amino acids to rebuild that tissue that it needs. Um, and growth hormone is the primary thing that does that. Um, leptin and ghrelin they they help control my my hunger and thirst, and when I feel full and satiated, um, those are hormones that communicate. We know that different foods can trigger those things, but also exercise helps regulate that those hormones. We all hear about insulin, right? It helps pull sugar out of my blood into my muscles. Uh, Garolin or, um, or glucagon does opposite. It pulls sugar out of my muscles, out of my glycogen, out of my muscles, into my blood. And when we exercise, it helps our body regulate sugar better. Cortisol, a stress hormone. And when we're under stress, it, wants to, it causes our body to kind of fight or flight. Um, so exercise actually helps keep cortisol in check. And then testosterone, estrogen. Testosterone influences muscle growth. Uh, women do have testosterone, uh, not in the same proportion. Um, and estrogen helps bone growth, bone health. So men do have estrogen as well, um, but again, not in the same percentage of proportion. So again, exercise helps secrete these things. It helps keep others in check, um, and it helps again, it helps restore and keep the body growing and adapting and maintaining. Our muscles, right? we've got different types of muscle fibers. Some are more geared towards using oxygen for um, endurance activities, and some are more geared um, for power and explosive types of activity. Um, so when we, when we move, right, we're creating a demand on these muscles. Um, and when we create those, the demand on these muscles, those hormones say, I need to adapt these muscles. And those muscles can get slightly bigger, not hulking big, but they can grow 
for every pound of muscle we gain, we burn about 35 calories just to maintain that muscle. So if I gain five pounds of muscle, that's over, that's, uh, five, over 500, 600 calories uh, just to maintain that muscle. Hyper, hypertrophy is when the muscles grow. Um, hyperplasia is when those muscles split uh, to create more muscle. Again, your hormones control all that. Uh, glycogen is that sugar our muscles use for energy. Mitochondria is a powerhouse, right? And we get more blood vessels. We, uh, for every pound of muscle we grow, we get more vascularization to it that uses more energy. And a lot of times we hear of, especially older women who fall and break their hip. Um, one reason is because um, in life we don't really move like this much anymore, or we don't move like this, um, or if we're moving, we're doing this, emptying the dishwasher and, and putting stuff up in the cabinet, we do this twisting rotation, right? most likely broke the hip and then fell. But uh, exercise, again, helps that coordination, helps movement and economy, helps balance, um, and helps prevent falls. Yeah, you okay? Yeah. Yeah, it's called a uh, principle of reversibility, right? So if we don't use it, we lose it. And that's what happens kind of as we age, right? We, we don't, if we don't move, our body doesn't need to support that metabolically active tissue. So it, it atrophies, it goes away versus hypertrophy, it, it builds up. Um, so um, there's... <laughs> Okay. To some degree, um, there, there's going to be uh, some sort of equilibrium our body wants to achieve, and it's going to adapt. It's, there's a said principle, it's called specific adaptations to imposed demands. So if the imposed demand is to sit for eight hours a day at work, come home and sit for six hours in front of the TV, um, the imposed demand is to sit. So it's not going to need strong glutes and strong quads and strong abs to support that. Um, if at work we still have an eight hour sedentary day, but if I get up and move a lot around a little bit, uh, maybe I, over my lunch hour or before or after work, I get some exercise in um, and then I go home and somewhat active at home, my, my body's going to adapt to that, so. Um, yep, some good questions as well, so. Um, a lot of times when we exercise, we think of muscles. We might think of our heart and lungs, but how many of us think of our bones, okay? When we exercise, especially um, weight-bearing, load-bearing activities, um, it stresses our bones like it stresses our muscles, and that, that stress, again, triggers that hormone response saying, hey, I need to adapt, um, and it, it's, it can strengthen our bone. And what we found is that if we stress our axial skeleton, our spine and our ribs, that that signals a stronger signal to enhance our bone density more than our uh, appendicular system. Uh, so. That does benefit us, but any type of like overhead types of activities stresses the axial skeleton, and that has been shown to increase bone density better. So any type of like overhead, any type of uh, stress, again on the ribs and spine and stuff like that. So I put the calcium myth here. Um, our body needs so much calcium each day. That's you know makes up. It's one of the most prominent minerals in our body. But if I just take calcium, is that going to make my bones stronger? <laughs> yeah. I have to create a demand for it. Just like if I, had to, if I were to drink a protein shake, that's not going to make my muscles bigger. I have to create a demand for those nutrients to be used in my body. Uh, so I have to exercise in order for those amino acids to reconstruct themselves as 
muscle tissue, just like I have to create a demand for calcium in order for it to be used. Now we have to have enough of it there, so if we're not getting enough calcium, this may help us get enough calcium. But if I'm not creating a demand for calcium in my body, that calcium is not going to be put to use in our bones. It's going to be used somewhere else or excreted. All right, our joints. Um, yeah, if we don't use it, we lose it. A lot of times um, people say, like, running is hard on my knees, um, or running is hard on my back, or different things like that. Um, and it can be, but um, our mechanics have to be appropriate. How many of us learned how to throw a ball in PE class? Okay. How many of you have learned how to run? Okay, none of us really kind of were taught proper you know, torso or stride length and where our foot position needs to be. Most of us land on our heels if we try to run, and it's that it sends a lot of force into our knees and hips and our lower back, and which then causes knee problems, hip problems, and lower back problems. Um, but when we move, if we don't move. Here's a sponge I haven't used in a while. I kind of use this. It's kind of dry and flaky. It's brittle. Okay. Again, that's kind of what our bones and joints do if we don't move them. That they, they don't really have a demand for anything here. That's very porous. Um, but if I were to add water to this, right, here's, a, here's a more youthful or a younger sponge. But um, if I doesn't mean that this sponge is no good, right? But if I start to add, introduce water into it, um, just by moving, right? When we move, we start to secrete the synovial fluid into our joint. Um, it becomes more flexible and pliable. I just put just a, a little bit of water in there. Um, but you know, the more we move, if there's kind of this kind of s s release and s squish and release, and it creates that movement, uh, fluid. Yep. Is that why when I squat, I drive it for the first time? Yeah. One wheel hurts. And the next time off, the other wheel hurts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can push through those first 10 to 15 minutes of activity, that's usually the most painful, because that's when you're, you're, you're moving through energy systems. So you're moving from, from anaerobic to aerobic in your Joints just don't feel that good, but that synovial fluid starts to build up in your joints and your joint capsules, and then after about 30 minutes, like, hey, this is great. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah, and if you haven't been on there, your body's not adapted to that, so you impose those demands on it, and you're going to recover, and you're going to supercompensate, and your muscles will hypertrophy. Right, you're going to go, you know, all these things are going to change to make you more proficient at doing that. Wonderful. Sure. That's great. That's a perfect example right here. Yeah, your fountain of youth is that exercise is moving. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that example. All right, we're going to look at our cardiovascular functioning, how our blood works, um, increased lung capacity, our stroke volume. It's basically how much blood our heart can squeeze out in each beat. So if your left ventricle pumps oxygenated blood throughout your whole entire body from the top of your head to the tip of your toes against gravity and whatnot. So I just grabbed a paper towel here and soaked it with some water. Um, I don't know if I can get any water out of here, but so my squeezing that it's kind of like the left ventricle or left chamber in my heart, and but the stronger my hand is, the more water I can expel out of this little paper towel. Right, so if someone had less grip strength, they could probably squeeze it all they want and couldn't get anything out of it. Uh, if I have a stronger grip strength. I can squeeze a little bit more water. So it's the same idea with our other heart. When we exercise, 
can increase stroke volume, the heart becomes stronger, it pumps more blood out per contraction, and then our resting heart rate goes down. Our heart becomes more efficient at what it does. Uh, we get a more uh, consistent heart rhythm as well, um, especially with atrial rhythm. Again, we get more blood vessels. Again, that's to support growth of tissue, mostly muscle, muscle tissue, and that's metabolic, metabolically active, so it's using calories to support that, it, that tissue. Um, our body becomes more efficient. Um, our body produces more red blood cells, so it's able to carry more oxygen. So when we climb that flight of stairs, our lung capacity is increased, our heart has been stronger, and we have more red blood cells to carry more oxygen. So it becomes, so when, you, when you ride that bike, that becomes less, less effort and becomes more easier and more easy and more enjoyable. Um, hemodynamics, so how your blood flows through your uh, veins and arteries um, becomes more efficient. Our blood vessels are more elastic when we move and when we exercise. When we don't exercise, they become a little more brittle. Your blood pressure increases. That puts more stress on the heart. Um, it can weaken blood vessels. Um, again, we've talked about metabolically active. We use more calories uh, and we use energy more efficiently. Um, when we exercise, we're able to pull sugar into our, our muscles more efficiently. Our body's able to use insulin more. People who have type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetic exercise helps their body respond to sugar better. Um, we utilize fat better if we exercise for 30 minutes continually at a moderate intensity level, so like that 5 to 8 mets or 60% of our maximum heart rate. Um, we start to use fat for energy as well as our sugar energy. Sugar is kind of our quick energy. If, if the fire alarm went off right now, we'd all get up and move out of here quickly. That would be the quick sugar energy. But if I need to run from here to Blue Harbor and back, Right, I would use fat energy for doing that. Um, that yes. Yep. Yep. Sure. Yeah, that's a good, very good question. Um, so when we eat, if we if we have a caloric surplus. That's going to go through a series of chemical reactions and get stored as fat. Um, when we if we have a energy need, it's carbohydrates is going to be the first one to, um, to be used. It's easier and more efficient. And then we might tap into as long as there's oxygen available, it will take some fat as well. So it'll take um, basically a, a triglyceride. It's got a little glyceride with three fatty acid chains and it breaks those into free fatty acids and when we eat certain foods we might have an elevated triglyceride level because there's more fat floating around in our blood. Uh, so when we exercise it helps utilize that fat for energy more efficiently. So it is stored fat because that fat we eat in our food is going to get stored. Um, I won't go into this a whole lot, but basically when we exercise at a higher intensity, um, it's kind of like your engine. Like if, if you were to coast at maybe the 30 miles of the speed limit or something like that, um, it's going to maintain a, an engine temperature. But if I were to step on the gas and take my tachometer to the, the red line, um, that's going to increase the engine temperature quite a bit. And that uses a lot more oxygen, it uses more fuel. And if I were to park the car in the parking lot, it's going to take longer for that engine to cool down. So that's kind of the idea of this higher intensity ex exercise is we're using more fuel and are burning our engine hotter. So even after 
about 20 minutes to an hour after we're done exercising when we do high intensity interval training. Um, our metabolism is still revved up. Uh, we're still burning calories at a higher rate uh, for about an hour after exercise. Um, kind of interesting here was with, um, with exercise, it releases GABA or GABA. Um, uh, I don't like protein, but basically I, I think of these like earplugs, right? If it's, we have a noisy environment or, or stress stressors, um, that's going to damage my ears, right? So if I put earplugs in, it, it dampens those sound waves and it doesn't seem as loud. So it's kind of those. GABA is kind of like the earplugs where it takes stress or, or stress and if we exercise it releases this GABA and it reduces our stress response. Um, it reduces that um, effect of cortisol on our body. So exercise can serve as a stress buffer. Um, it's not going to make stress go away, but our body is going to be better able to deal with the stress when we do face it. Uh, one of our uh, reasons why we, when we get under stress, our muscles tighten. Um, so when we exercise, it serves as an outlet. Right? We, we want to do this fight or flight, but we never, we never fight or flee when, we, when our computer doesn't work or there's a car that's slow in front of us. All these, it builds up the stress, but we never do anything with it. But exercise serves as that outlet for it. It serves as that fight or flight release. A lot of things with our brain health. Um, again, there was a study. They, they took 378-year-old people. And they had them walk um, 72 blocks a week. They followed them up about nine years later. Um, they had more gray matter and less cognitive delay. And our brain uses most of our oxygen. Like our, our brain is only about 2% of our body weight, but it uses about 20% of our oxygen and calories. So also when we exercise, we have this BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, and that kind of serves as um, it's fertilizer, basically. It helps our dendrites connect. Um, so uh, we like to garden. One of our first years gardening was like, well, let's just take soil from the backyard and put in a pot and s plant plants in it. And this is the soil that was at the end of the season uh, in that pot. Okay. And what do you notice about this ugly soil, right? <laughs> Compared to this potted plant mix. Okay. You can pass it around if you want. How can you imagine what would the plant look like in the light soil versus the dark soil? Right? It's kind of the same idea. Same idea, right? That all right. Um, that's kind of what BDN, uh, BDNF can help do is help fertilize the brain, make it a more rich environment for our dendrites to connect. And our memory is in our hippocampus, makes those connections. Um, so I just had that string, like all those are connected. So our white matter is where those axons line up and the gray matter is where those dendrites connect. That uses most of the oxygen. The BDNF helps facilitate those connections. So we're more likely to retain information, learn new skills. So that's the physical mind. There's also the uh, the psychological mind. Right when we exercise, we learn new things, we accomplish goals, we reveal things in us. Uh, we feel uh, more accomplished. Once we feel more accomplished, we feel more confident. Uh, that's locus of control. Is I have the power to decide for myself rather than a doctor or somebody saying you should do this. Self-efficacy is I have the the wherewithal to do what I want to do. And we found that exercise 
is as effective or even more effective than certain medications uh, in relieving depression. Uh, part of that is because exercise helps, re uh, helps release neurotransmitters and especially dopamine and stuff. And we have these parts in our brain that uh, are called uh, cannabinoid receptors and opioid receptors, right? So these are things that reduce pain, they enhance pleasure, and that's why drugs tend to work, right? Because they, they target these same areas that enhance pleasure, reduce pain, but they do it on an unnatural level. Um, Exercise enhances sleep. Um, able to fall asleep faster. Usually have more restful sleep. Sleep longer. And uh, this is the last slide here um, is it has a sexual function as well. Um, again, when we look at if you watch any NFL game, probably every commercial break there's probably a Cialis or a Viagra commercial, right? Um, and probably then a beer commercial as well. But uh, actually kind of beer um, leads to what Cialis will help re reverse, right? This is the uh, um, erectile dysfunction is typically with um, you know, overweight, diabetic males. Um, it interferes with blood flow, so we know that exercise helps influence blood flow all throughout the body, the brain, the heart, the lungs, muscles, even the genitalia, right, the sexual organs. To make muscle contractions more forceful, right, so having the sex act um, um, is enhanced. And also um, kind of the psychological aspect. Again, people who exercise have that higher self-efficacy, a different body image, and they might feel more comfortable without their clothes on, right? That, that they, they have a different perception of, of their body. Um, so I, I purposely met the, made this small. And I, I wrote down some of these and put this in my window on my office. All right. And these are the benefits of exercise. So I tried to put them all on one slide. And this is probably not a totally exhaustive list. This were probably some things that I, through reading and stuff, and just kind of off the top of my head, kind of put down. And I purposely tried to make them small, well, not small, but put them all on one slide. So a lot of times if you watch TV and you see a commercial, a drug commercial, right, it will help do this for you. But then be, avoid all these things, all, you know, this, all this uh, side effects. So if you exercise, um, you'll have higher human growth hormone release in your body. And you'll also have all this other stuff, all right? And this is all good stuff. <laughs> so sweat, right, um, is our fountain of youth. You, you may just have to update your sneakers or something, or maybe buy a membership to get you in the door somewhere. But you, I tell my students, you can do that in your living room. You don't need fancy equipment. You don't need um, a whole lot of stuff to sweat. Um, you just right out your front door, even in your living room. So take all that stuff. That's probably the best place for it. Okay. And get out there and move instead. Right. Um, you'll probably feel a lot better after 20 minutes of doing this rather than 20 minutes of doing this and this and this. Right. So, as in conclusion, right, it's a timeless quest to preserve life, um, restore youth and sexual vitality. Um, have kind of a new and emerging idea of what exercise is and aging. And it's more of an internal transformation more than what something we can buy or what someone can sell us.
so, all right? <laughs> Thank you.